This is episode number 477 with Kimberly Hill, The Common Mistakes Men Make in Dating. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And if you want support on your journey to lasting love, I wrote a book that can help. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it is filled with 30 chapters with exercises, stories, tips. Some of our podcast interviews have been transcribed into the book because they've been so helpful. And these are all designed to help you show up, stand up and speak up so you can really step more fully into your value. You can find the book on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And this week's tip from the book is step number seven, be the love you wish to find in the world. We often think we need somebody who's so different from us and who's going to complete us and we're going to be broken and they're going to repair us. (laughs) We have all these false notions of love based on crazy stories that we see and read and And really, the more you can step into love, into loving your life, loving your passions, loving who you are and who you're hanging around with and what you're doing every day, the more you're going to just naturally attract that into your life. I call it pull energy versus push energy. We usually like kind of push hard to get what we want in love, and that's just repelling energy. So when we are magnetizing who we want because we are already living a life that is so full and wonderful and magnetic, we just surround ourselves with amazing people. And I see Kimberly is nodding her head. (laughs) So before I bring you on, Kimberly, I just wanted to give a shout out to my Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date, and it's for women over 40. Sorry, men, you can't join us, but we are this safe, sacred space for women who really want to grow on their journey to love. So it's a space for growth, not complaints and victim mentality. There are lots of groups for that. We are not that. We are a place where we really give content and value. I I go live every week in the group. We have seven monitors who monitor the page to keep it really safe and sane because we all need a safe and sane space. So uh, join us at your last first date. And now for my guest, Kimberly. She is an international dating and relationship coach. She supports men to attract and keep healthy, loving relationships. She has a unique coaching style that brings in a humorous and lighthearted approach. I love that. While getting deep into the heart of what really matters. And she has experience with a wide range of modalities and practices from psychology to energy healing to mindfulness, stress reduction, relationship theory, dating strategy, neuro-linguistic programming, which I do also, and solution-focused coaching. Sounds amazing. Kimberly, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excited to have you. It sounds like you really take your job seriously and have gone through a lot of your own training, which I really respect a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there are There's lots of ways to become a coach. Uh, You certainly don't have to go through the formal route, um, but that's what I chose to do. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, same. I think that it, you know, you can definitely be a great coach and not have to have formal training, like you Mm -hmm. said. But I think when you do go through formal training, you get some basic foundational stuff like you know some training that helps you to deal with some of the deeper issues Mm -hmm. some of the stuckness because people aren't just what's at the surface they are a lot deeper and I think a lot of coaching doesn't go deep enough I um it sounds like you you get to the to the heart of the matter which I love I hear what's often not really being said. (laughs) Yes. Who comes to see you like a lot of people a lot of women have this false notion that men Mm -hmm don't get help. So, mm. so who are these guys who are coming to a dating coach who's a woman? <laughs> yeah, fantastic question. Um, well, there's a lot that don't, let's be real. Um, <laughs> but the, the men that I typically am working with are in either their late 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s. And they've had a few relationships that didn't work out. And they're really wanting to move forward in a way that feels authentic and much less frustrating than the times that they've tried before. Um, I do work with men that um, 
have maybe had a divorce, sometimes even two, and are saying, I don't even know where to start. Like the world of dating has radically changed since I was dating. We are dealing with uh, online dating um, and dating during a pandemic as well. So <laughs> support me because I really want to find the right person. I'm just not sure how. So. Yeah, it sounds a lot like who comes to me. So they're yeah. just in a, a different sex. Yeah. I, I think this is a very, um, it's an unfortunate I, notion that men don't look for help or men are not mm. deep. I mean, I think, I think men and women don't really understand each other so well. And I, I, I'm wondering if like part of your, the work you do is to help men understand women better. Yes, I do. It's not maybe the focus of it. Uh, the focus is much more uh, improving the internal world of the client that I'm dealing with. But of course, a lot of men choose to come to me uh, because of my qualifications and how I work, but also because I have a female brain <laughs> and they're often wondering what women are thinking or why their relationships aren't working. Uh, and it's often because, you know, men are tapping into more of the logical side of their brain and women are basing a lot of what we do based on how we're feeling. So there often is a disconnect. Um, and so I am helping men to communicate better with women, but it's also just communicating better in general. Yeah. Communication is huge. Yeah. So what are some of the common mistakes? Let's get right to those. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, I, ha I do have a ebook on this and it goes into probably a little more maybe detail and example that we're going to cover in today's show. But the number one mistake, right? And women are going to resonate with this too, is wondering if you're good enough for someone of quality, for, for someone of value, if you're good enough for the dating process, if you're ever going to find that special somebody so the first mistake is really coming into the process of dating with a mindset that is not supportive of the process. Um, many of us have had relationships that didn't work out or didn't feel good. Uh, they can make us feel really doubtful about the process um, or we see somebody and think they're way out of my league. Uh, but the truth is, you know, if you value yourself, and you believe in yourself, your experiences, it's what you were talking about in your intro, pretty much the law of attraction. If you mm -hmm. feel worthy and you feel like you are going to have a good experience and you, it is possible to meet someone that's right for you. Uh, you're going to get that in your experience. So number one mistake is, is not valuing uh, oneself enough. Yeah, yeah, totally. Second, second mistake. <gasps> the second mistake, <laughs> <laughs> the second mistake would be uh, especially nowadays where we're using our phones to do a lot of communicating, right? Or we can be meeting somebody online. Uh, we can be talking within a dating app. Uh, we can then move to uh, communicating through text message on our phone. So uh, a second mistake that not everybody, but often the anxious type of daters are dealing with is anxious texting. So overthinking everything that they're saying all the time, <laughs> right? Texting is a very convenient form of communication, but it often ends in miscommunication. So a lot of men are saying, well, did I say the right thing? Or when should I respond? Or how long should I wait until I message back? And, you know, should I basically write my life story in a, a big text message? So a lot of frustration and anxiety around how to text in an appropriate way <laughs> uh, is definitely a mistake that uh, a lot of men are making in the dating process. I just say, just ask her out, man. Just get off right. the phone and, and go meet her in person. <laughs> like that's how you're going to build that strong bond and really get to know somebody. Um, a mm. lot of guys hide behind their mm. phones, right? So for all you men out there that are dating in your <laughs> boxers in your living room, it's not the best way to do it, right? <laughs> Leave the house in your boxers. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, get out. Get out. <laughs> yeah. So that that's definitely a, a common mistake is just overthinking the whole texting process or relying too much on uh, text messaging as a form of communication. Oh, God, I hate that one. <laughs> All right. Those are two really good ones. Yeah. What's the next one? Number three, again, this is more so related to the anxious type of dater, 
right? The person that's overthinking the process a lot or is nervous about the process. Um, and that's moving at lightning pace. Okay. So moving too quickly, uh, no relationship is going to work, uh, with a woman who is secure if you're rushing it or forcing the process. Uh, so I'm not an advocate of, you know, creating rules around dating. I don't think there's one prescriptive way for people to date, but I do say, and I have had to take my own advice here <laughs> is at least date somebody at least, at least, at least date somebody for a minimum of three months before you make some kind of grand commitment to them. And I still think three is a pretty shy amount of time. So <laughs> a lot of men, and again, women too, they find someone that they like and they want to kind of have that safety security and that commitment right away. The truth is they don't really know enough about that person to be certain, but they are probably valuing things like the idea of being loved over compatibility, uh, respect, uh, and other areas. So slow down and enjoy the process. <laughs> totally. I, I think it's ancient. It's interesting that you keep bringing up the anxious data because often these are the people who reach out for help yeah. is the people who, who really don't trust themselves. They overthink, they overanalyze, they, um, they get nervous too much mm -hmm. and they self-sabotage. I mean, I've had men disqualify themselves over the phone. Like yeah. here's all the reasons why you probably don't want to date me. And I'm like, I wasn't thinking that before, but now I do. Yeah. So I'm like, stop doing that. You yeah. know, it's like, you know, there's a time mm. for kind of that self-depreciating humor, but if it's your main, if that's your main role there, um, yeah, you're going to, you're going to convince people to walk away from you. Yeah. It's actually <laughs> not said as a joke. It is said yeah. as, well, you're really together woman. So you probably won't date me because. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I'm a pretty open person and I won't date you because of what you just said. So that's, yeah. that's the issue. It's, it's um, yeah, some people do it as humor and that also is off-putting if you don't know somebody well, because yeah. you don't know that it's humor. A joke. Right? No, yeah. you don't. No, it's there's, not attractive when someone yeah. puts themselves down, right? Um, yeah. You're right. A lot of men come to me with many self-limiting beliefs, including that I'm mm -hmm. not good enough for this person, or yeah. I don't have enough money, or I'm not tall enough, or mm -hmm. I'm not well endowed enough, or I'm not yep. this enough. And <laughs> they then meet a woman that they think is amazing. And they think I'm just not good enough for her. Yeah. So I'm not going to go there. Right. So guys have actually said those words to me, like, yeah, I am not wealthy enough for you. I like, how do they know who what's wealthy? And I, you know, I lost inches as I aged. So, mm -hmm. but not over there. And that thing still were, it's like, oh my God. Oh, bless. Because you, you know, know, it's coming from like a place of insecurity. And, yes. you know, I even look at my dating past and I could see how insecure I was in certain areas too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it for was sure. only in the last few years, really, as I've gotten more into this work and helping others that I've recognized a lot of my patterns that were not helping me. Let's just say that. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So what's the fourth mistake? Mistake number four is tolerating poor behavior. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the guys that I work with would probably consider themselves people pleasers or nice guys. Um, and very often, if you're someone who wants to be seen as a really nice person, uh, you'll often tolerate poor behavior. Um, and again, it's going back to prioritizing this idea of love over things like trust or respect or affection. Um, and, you know, I, there's that popular saying out there that love is all you need, but I disagree. Uh, love is not the only thing we need. We need, we need a lot of other things in relationships to make them work. So, um, tolerating poor behavior from, uh, and this goes for men and women, right? Uh, poor behavior throughout the dating process, how they're treating you, um, whether there's signs of abuse there, whether there's body shaming happening, whether there's gaslighting, just plain old rudeness, uh, and imbalance in the dating process. So, you know, typically men are the pursuers, right? But if they're pursuing and the woman isn't returning anything back to them or she's game playing, uh, he's going to get, you know, you, you would hope that he'd get tired and move on. But often men continue to pursue because 
you know, they believe that might, that might be the only woman that they'll ever get. Right. So they, they put up with poor behavior um, yeah. and that just doesn't work uh, in the long term. Absolutely. That's scarcity mindset. And, yep. uh, it just reminds me of the rules and uh, mm-hmm. a, a client who just hired me told me that her sister had given her the rules book to read mm-hmm. after her divorce. And she was like, she was trying to be this person that she wasn't. And a lot of what the rules advocate for are let a man do everything for you and don't offer to ever pay and don't offer to ever do anything and don't initiate anything. And I'm like, yeah, this was written with attachment styles in mind. And it's from an anxious attachment woman who wanted yeah. to be less anxious. So she became the opposite and became an avoidant and played a game. Yeah, the game playing just doesn't work, no. right? The truth is you don't have to give all of yourself right away. So you're, it's okay to hold a little bit of you back. But game playing, I mean, I don't advocate for it. It no. certainly is not something that I've ever felt that I could do. I would never recommend it to anybody because, well, it just, it is what it is. It's game playing. It's surface. <laughs> it's not meaningful, right? Yeah. And there's also the bait and switch that happens when you stop playing the game and show up as your real self. Right? Who is this person? Who is this person, right? Like a lot of us have a basic need of like certainty. We want to know who we're dating and who that person is. And if they radically change on us, it happens a lot when people get married, right? Oh yeah. You're playing a role up until marriage and then, Oh, now I can be my real self. And then your partners go, I don't know who this is. This isn't the man that I married, right? Yeah. (laughs) This isn't the woman that I married. (laughs) So yeah. Avoid that. (laughs) Yes, definitely. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So mistake number five, mistake number five is dating and having no clue what you're looking for. Okay. So not knowing what you're wanting from a partner and a relationship. Most people don't. Um, I'll be the first to admit that most of my relationships just kind of happened. Uh, I wasn't considering the type of man I wanted to date. Uh, I wasn't very clear on what my own values were. So I got into relationships and I kind of started to learn about that person as I went. Um, And well, I'm not in any of those relationships anymore. So Mm -hmm. Uh, the truth is, is getting a, and I, I'm not advocating necessarily a list, a big list that you, you check off. I don't really think that's the way to go, but getting clear on the type of person that uh, would be compatible for you and the type of relationship that you want to have. Uh, for example, if you're a man that is dating right now and you already have two children and you no longer want to have children, that's going to be a, a strong value for you, right? You value the family you have now, but you're not looking to meet someone and have more children. Uh, now, if you meet an amazing woman who wants to have four kids, it's just not going to work out because you're just not aligning on something that's very, very important. So get clear on what you want and what you don't want. Um, so yeah, understand obviously, uh, you know, what you're not going to tolerate and understand what you are looking for in terms of value-based characteristics, right? We all want someone who's amazingly good looking, but <laughs> beyond that, what are you really looking for from a partner? So get yeah. clear on it because otherwise I always say you're doing the spaghetti at the wall tactic. You know, you're just throwing yourself out there and you're just seeing what sticks and what comes your way. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. And so people really have trouble figuring this part out. I would say that uh, this is one of the hardest things. And in my Facebook group just a week ago, I was talking about must-have lists. And this woman said, my must-have is a job. A man has to have a job. Fair enough. So I said, so if he doesn't have a job, but he is retired and has a lot of money, will you not date him? Mm. Good point. I said, you know, we have to really look at these must haves and Mm -hmm. figure out what's beneath it. So she said, well, I've, I've supported other men before and I don't want to do that again. Okay. So now that's the thing is you don't want to support him. So he has to be independent financially Financially in his own way. Right. Right. And, and so when you're looking for the job, you'll probably miss these other people who don't have the job. Yeah, but have other means and are not going to drain your income or your your money. Yeah, and we often get so confused about this that we miss great people because they have the values that are going to connect us 
but I that. totally agree. Right. <laughs> like the list should not be, he has to be this tall. He has to have this job. He has to have this color hair. All that is superficial. Really. Mm-hmm. It truly is right. The guy that maybe is two inches shorter than you could be the most amazing man you've ever been with. He could be the best lover. He could be financially stable. He could value the same things as you, but because you wrote that kind of superficial list, you didn't go there and you're never going to have that opportunity. So yeah, I'm not, I'm a little bit against the idea of list creating unless it has to do very much with that, the, what you value and the fact that you're looking for those same values. Absolutely. So yeah. do you have a, an exercise that you can share with our audience that helps people get mm-hmm. to know what those values are? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, when I was t- talking about this dating handbook for men, I've created, it has those five mistakes in it that we just spoke about and how to mm-hmm. overcome them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and within that, there's a couple of different uh, worksheets uh, that men can do. One is uh, one is understanding what they're not going to tolerate. So making sure they visit the, their past relationships and maybe some of the behaviors that they don't ever want to accept and really get clear on uh, what they're not going to put up with moving forward. This would also apply to women too, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and then the, the second worksheet in here is uh, a little taste of doing a values exercise or values elicitation and getting an idea of uh, the five most important qualities that really matter to you uh, when you're looking at dating somebody. And height isn't on there. (laughs) Um, you know, uh, it's not superficial in that sense. It's more value. Financial stability is on there because maybe that's really important. Um, wants children or doesn't want children is on there. Uh, level of education is on there. Um, ability to communicate is on there, right? Uh, trustworthiness, vulnerability, that's on the list. So you get to decide what's really the most important things for you at your life and what you're looking for from somebody else. Uh, and that will help determine whether someone is compatible for you or not. So, yeah. So that sounds great. So if I, if I was a guy coming to you and yeah. I would say, okay, help me figure out how to even know on that list, what what is me? Like, how would I, how would you help me? Yeah. So, okay. So one of the values exercises that I do, uh, with men is I actually bring a big list of values up on the screen. Uh, so you could go Google this too. Um, it's probably very easy to find a big list of values. And the question that I ask men is looking at this list what are the things that pop out to you off this page that have been the most important to you in the last three months of your life? Okay. So looking at it from the lens of the last three months, not from when you were 17 years old and what you value, not from when you were 24 and first dating in the last three months of your life right now, what are the values that speak to you the most? And oftentimes when men are looking at this page of values, they'll come up with a list of somewhere between 10 and 15, right? It's a pretty long list. I I imagine there's maybe a hundred values on there. And then we go through a prioritization of those. So we look at those 15, we see if any are really similar to one another. If they are, we pick which one that resonates the best. And it, it, it shaves our list down, let's say from 15 to maybe 10. Uh, and then I get them to prioritize those 10 values. So uh, it's a little hard to explain, but it's, we cross-reference. So we take the first value that uh, we picked off that list and we ask ourselves between that value and the other nine on our list, right? Which is more, more important to us. It's not that any of them are not important. It's just finding out which one is most important. So between something like authenticity, or vulnerability, which is more important to you. And maybe men will say authenticity. You know, I want a woman who's authentically herself. So he'll put a check mark next to that. And then I'll say cross reference uh, uh, is authenticity more important to you or adventure? And he might go, Well, I really love someone that's adventurous. So I'm going to put a check there. And we do this cross referencing with those. Uh, 10 values until we uh, get our top three. And then we talk about the top three and what they really mean to the individual, because oftentimes the top three that come out, either they were expecting them or they are radically different from what they were thinking. So 
that's one of the ways I do a values elicitation. Um, there's a couple of other ways to do it too that I find that's, most effective. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times without a list, people just have no idea even where to start, right? It's just like, yeah. what's a value? I don't know. <laughs> it helps. It helps to have the list for sure. On this yeah. workbook and in, in the ebook as well, there's a, there's a one page list, mm. uh, which are more related to, uh, you know, dating in, in this context here. Um, and it just helps people kind of get a sense, right? Like, what are you really looking for? And one of them is similar future plans, like compatibility with a partner. Let's say you're in your fifties, you've had your kids, you know, work is maybe going to be for another 10 or 15 years. And then that's it. Well, what are you actually wanting from your life at, at this point in time? Because if, you know, let's say you're dating a little younger and they're wanting to go travel the world, but you're wanting to, you know, buy a summer home or something like that. And your guys are totally different in terms of what you want from the future. You might have a lot of fun right now, but in time, are you going to be compatible? So it's often important to not stress or overthink these things, but to have a sense of where you want to go in life, because a very important element of knowing whether you're compatible with somebody is, do you share uh, similar future plans, right? Do you want the same things out of life? And can you support each other to achieve those things? So. Yeah. And, and sometimes you think you do and you don't mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Like when I married my husband, we both had similar life goals and we're going in the same direction. And within two years, we had split off into two different directions. And that happens. there were some signs that I couldn't read because I didn't know these relationship skills well mm -hmm. enough to really understand that those little intuitive hits I had were really worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we can't always predict what no. will happen, especially if there's a crisis and we don't know how a person is in crisis. Yeah, um, that's very true. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. There are ways to tell how somebody can be in stress. And I'm wondering if you advise men to go through a stressful situation to really see how a woman responds. Uh, yeah, well, and that's kind of why I say like, you know, spend some time and slow the process down because you don't know enough about this woman to be certain. So give it some time so you can see what they're like in multiple scenarios. Uh, when I was dating my partner, Andrew, I, I like to ask him a lot of questions and I love listening to him talk about his history and how he dealt with, you know, a big motorcycle accident he had and how he processed the stress. And I was learning through questions. And then I, I kind of remember at one point in time, early on in our dating, I said to him, I said, you don't ask me that many questions. Here's Kimberly as a coach, like asking so <laughs> many questions, obviously. Right. And he's like, no, he's like, I have learned a lot through observation. Mm. And I was like, fascinating. Like we learn in different ways. And he was just, he was observing who I was in all the situations that we had together. And he's like, I have a, I'm getting a pretty clear idea of the type of person you are. And I thought, I thought it was beautiful. Although I yeah. was like, ask me questions. I want to tell you stuff. <laughs> right. I love talking about myself. Right. <laughs> but uh, he was learning through observation and we took the process slow. Um, and we've seen each other in multiple different situations. Now we've had some arguments. I understand more his conflict style. He understands mine. Uh, I understand what he's like in really stressful moments and he knows what I'm like. Uh, and we're also learning how to co-regulate uh, one another and ourselves. So uh, it's really important That's what you're huge. saying. I, I don't say to men, okay, go fabricate a stressful moment and see what <laughs> right. she's like, but I say, take your time to really understand who this person is um, because 
every relationship will have solvable problems and every relationship will have perpetual problems this is from the Gottman Institute, right? Oh, yeah. Solvable problems are thing that, things that come up in your relationship that you can deal with, you can find a resolution for, and you can move on from them. And then there are the perpetual problems, right? The things that you just kind of have to accept that your partner is or the way they think about something that are never going to change. And you have to ask yourself, can I accept that yeah. and be with this person? If you can't, fine no judgment, move on. But if you can just know that no relationship is perfect and there will be things that at times you feel you need to tolerate. Right. So yeah, yeah. You get to know someone. Yeah, is it, totally. I mean, it's, and I see so many women come to me with like, this guy would be great if, and how mm. can I change him? <laughs> you know? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and it's like, they're tolerating behaviors where, you know, it's, it's a combination. So I'm, I'm curious on your end, um, just what I see a lot is women who would say, let get, get upset about a man who doesn't communicate well. And then I say, have you brought any of these issues to him? <laughs> have you communicated well? Oh, well, no, it feels really needy to ask for those things. No, and yeah. so, so unless you ask and unless you really are what you're seeking, you know, and, and really can communicate your needs and not feel needy, mm -hmm. you're not going to know if the other person can meet your needs. But if you find out they can't, then like move on, you know, we're, yeah. we're both going to be happier. Oh, people. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, even I was guilty of this too. Like I would do certain things, subtle behaviors to try and get a response or an answer from the man I was dating <laughs> instead of just saying, Hey, Andrew, I've been thinking and feeling this. Would you mind having a quick chat about it? Right? Like to be direct is such an important skill that a mm. lot of us lack men and women. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Communication is a two way street, right? Yeah. And I, often I'm teaching men to understand what their relationship needs are teaching them that it's not needy to have needs that we all have needs that most conflict is a result of an unmet need. So learning how to communicate and share what you're feeling, which is often teaching men the art, let's call it the art and science of vulnerability, right? Being able to share with your partner something that you're happy about or not happy about and know that you can do it in a safe way. Yeah. And then you're right. If they can meet your needs, awesome. If they can't, then the question is, is that a need that you can meet yourself? Or is it something that has to be met by your partner? If it has to be met by your partner and it's reasonable, right? <laughs> right. Okay. And they can't do it. Then maybe they're not the one for you, but you know, we can't expect our partners to meet all of our needs all of the time. No. And, and knowing what's yours, mine or ours is a really important part of relationships. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking of a show that I just started watching again called dating on the spectrum. Have you ever seen that? Oh yeah. yeah. I watched at least the first season of it. Yeah. It just came back to Netflix. And what I love about this show is it's pure. They're it's so these, blunt. I love it. They're so blunt. So these are all people on the spectrum and they're just like, so what do you think of me? Do you like me? I'm attracted to you. How do you feel about me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think this is going well. Me too. Okay. Would you like to, would you like a hug? May I have permission to hug you? I mean, it's just Oh, like, it's adorable. Oh, we can all is. learn from it. Honestly. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think about that all the time. If we could just be more of that, you know, and, and just say how we feel. Mm -hmm. And I, here's another thing that I think it also really gets me going, which is <laughs> <laughs> that a lot of women think men don't really have feelings. And they think that, um, that men can't perceive how they're feeling because they haven't said anything. So I always say like, if you come in with that face of mm -hmm. like, I'm tolerating this because you were not the height you said you were online. So I already can't stand you. And I'm going to just sit through this coffee and it's so clear. And then they go, well, why didn't he ask me out again? So mm. I, I say, and I'd love to hear your opinion that, that men really trust their intuition and their feelings much more than women. Women tend to override what their feelings are saying. And they're like, well, I didn't really feel it, but you know, he had some of the things on my checklist. And so I'll, I'll date him again. 
So what do you, what do you have to say? I, I think men are, we don't give them enough credit. They're highly intelligent. Uh, yes, they're very logical. So sometimes, uh, you know, even myself, I think like, oh, my partner is, I'm feeling emotional and I feel like he's trying to solve my problems, right? Instead of like meeting my emotions. So yeah, there's a disconnect that happens between men and women because we think different. But my partner is also an HSP, which is highly sensitive person. He knows what's going on. Like he, um, I swear he knows before I know, okay. He can tell when I walk into a room, if I'm in a good mood, bad mood, confused, anxious about something like we're very connected in our nervous systems. Um, and yeah, I don't think women give men enough credit. They are pretty intelligent. Yes. Maybe they don't process emotions quite the same way we do, but they definitely have them. Definitely. And I'm glad to hear you say that. I, I, you know, I can, I can hear the HSP based on his observation of you and him feeling you like, yeah. rather than asking the questions. And I think that's, that's part of that profile mm-hmm. is that people do feel the presence and the energy of each other. I mean, that's how I gauge whether I connect with people. Yeah. It's what's the energy exchange between the two of us. That's do you feel that good around that person? Yeah. Do you feel like you can be yourself around them? Exactly. Huge, huge green flags if they're going well, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's like, wait, what? We're just totally disconnected here. I don't feel seen or heard. Yeah, to, to speak to the women for a moment, because <laughs> I, I, I can very easily reflect on how I showed up. And the one thing that I was before my relationships and in my relationships was highly critical of my partner. Now, this was a reflection of whatever I was going through, my own insecurities, my own body issues, my own whatever that I was dealing with at different points in my life. I noticed that in my relationships, I was very critical of my partner, right? Very critical of how he looked, very critical of the way he thought, very critical of what he didn't do, right? Very critical of the things that he did, but I didn't think he was doing good enough. And I honestly communicated, not bluntly, but I would communicate with my body language or with protest behavior that I was dissatisfied with certain things that he was doing. I don't really remember complimenting my partner more than I criticized them. And I recognize that, and I'm only speaking on behalf of me right now, but I probably am speaking on behalf of a lot of women, (laughs) that women can be very critical of the men in their lives. And honest to God, I think a very quick solution for solving a lot of animosity that's happening in, in relationships is for women to stop pointing out the things that are not going well and start rewarding and praising the things that are going well. Men are really sensitive. When you criticize them or scoff at them or raise your eyes or hold them in contempt or criticize the way they do things, it makes them feel like crap right? And then they're not going to want to come on to you or spend time with you or feel attracted towards you because guess what? You represent all the things that they're not good at. So, you know, tip out there for women too is stop having such unreasonable expectations of men and start being more complimentary of the men in your life. Honestly, you'll start to have a whole different energy force around you. Such good advice. (laughs) Oh my God. I remember reading Gottman and, and learning about the five to one ratio of positives Mm -hmm. versus negatives. And it, it, first of all, I reflected back on my marriage and I realized that there was so much negative that I had, I had an empty, I was empty all the time. I had, Mm -hmm. I had nothing to give anymore because it was just negative, 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 negative. And then you get that little positive and it's just not enough. It's not enough at that point. Yeah. No. Or they don't believe it because everything is a criticism. And then when you do say something nice, they're like, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And also, how are you communicating? Are you communicating with passive aggressive communication with your body? Like you said, Mm -hmm. and, and people pick it up, you know, you might roll your eyes, you might do certain things. And so you know, I talk a lot about curiosity and, and mm-hmm. getting out of judgment and into curiosity. So, so you talk just now about something else that I think is also really important, which is to, is to mention and appreciate the good. And, you know, I, I, I have a client now who's in a great relationship and she, 
she would say like, oh, he just did something amazing. And I said, did you tell him how much you appreciate it? <laughs> She'd be like, no, I forgot. So, you know, over time she learned to say, you know, when you did this, that really just made me feel like this, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, it's reinforcing the good and not just looking for the bad because the more you reinforce, I mean, we all need that. We all need of course. It's positive a basic reinforcement. Need for sure. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. My, my boyfriend mm-hmm. jokes, he says, just treat me like a dog. <laughs> and what he means by that is give him snacks, rub his belly and tell him he's a good boy. <laughs> and he's like, I am a happy man. And I'm like, so I do that. I literally, and we joke about it. He'll, we'll be driving somewhere in his truck. And I know, cause I can sense his energy that he's getting cranky because he hasn't eaten. So guess who has a Snickers bar in her purse? I do. <laughs> I hand him a little snack and he's like so grateful. And then I'll put my arm on his neck and I'll give him a little back rub and tell him that I really appreciate wherever he's driving me to. And he's just turns into a whole new man. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I've had guests on who have compared relationships to dogs and pets, and um, oh my god, it's it's really true though. It's simple. It's simple. And of it's course, like, men need more than that, but yeah. it's just it's it's like don't forget to treat your partner like your friend. Mm-hmm. Right. We get into relationships and we end up treating our partners sometimes worse than we treat our coworkers or our friends. And we have to remember, like, you know, this is a person that we're choosing to spend our life with. Like, let's let's have that abundance mindset. Let's have that uh, growth mindset when it comes to our relationship, which is, you know, this individual is a human being that has feelings and they're not going to be perfect, but they're also trying their best. <laughs> oh, God, it's, it seems so obvious, but it's really not. No, I mean, I don't not. think people, people don't even realize it. I, I had a guest a while back who talked about how, when she first got married, she said, my marriage started to fall apart immediately. And I thought we had to get divorced because he wasn't doing what I told him to do. (laughs) She was like, I thought it was my job to make sure that he does his job well and that he, you know, that he gets certain clothes on and he does certain things. And so she was constantly criticizing him and had no idea. Way to demoralize somebody, right? Yeah, exactly. But she Mm -hmm. thought that was helpful you know, it's my job. She and, learned pretty quickly. It wasn't, I guess. Right. So yeah. she, she helps women now to stop trying to fix men and to really take a step back yeah. because I think it's hard when you're, when you're used to t- taking control. And I think for a lot of women who have been on their own for a long time, they've been in control of other things in their lives, like their work and mm-hmm. other, maybe their kids. And they think, well, you know, I control everything and I can't relent, release control because then I'll feel powerless. And mm. it's the worst thing you can do. And it doesn't well, mean you're disempowered, right? No, no, it doesn't. Mm. Like it, it, when we think that we need to fix somebody, what we're really shouting at them is that we inherently think something's wrong with them. So yeah. it's not, it's from their other person's perspective, it's coming from a negative place, even though from the woman's perspective, she's doing it probably with a positive intention in mind, right? She's probably not meaning to make the person feel bad, but that's the result of her actions. So yeah, (laughs) yeah. I I was once told by a counselor, um, Kimberly, you just can't be certain about everything all of the time. You have to learn to deal with some uncertainty. And I felt like she had reached through the phone and like gone like slap, slap on my face. And I was like, it's fair. I'm a Virgo. I like to have everything organized. We were talking Sandy about before I came on, I'm organizing my closet, like everything, you know, I like to do things in a certain way, but I can't control Andrew. God forbid, if I tried, it would not work out. We probably wouldn't be in a relationship anymore because yeah. he would see me as uh, crit- critical of him. He would think he was not good enough for me. And who wants to be around that energy? So, yeah. yeah and I would say yeah. you wouldn't want to be around him either because he would be the rollover play dead if going back to the dog analogy totally. and who's attracted to that, right? Nobody. Like women unconsciously are testing men all the time right? We're, we are poking at them to see if they're strong in their values or not. If you want to learn a little more about this, a fantastic book called Way of the Superior Man by David mm-hmm. Data, he talks about, talks about how women unconsciously test men. And I, as I was listening to it, I was like, okay, fair. I don't do that all the time now because I, I have this 
coaching business that I run. So I'm more aware probably than most people, but I'm like, I definitely do that too. (laughs) I definitely test Andrew and see if he's strong enough uh, or the kind of man that I'm hoping he is. And good thing he (laughs) passes the test, but um, (laughs) he taught also about the law of polarity, right? Uh, Think of two people on a dance floor and two people are trying to lead that dance. You're going to fumble. You're going to trip over one another. So there Mm -hmm. has to be a give and take in relationships. There has to be you know, yin and yang, there has to be masculine, feminine energy dynamics. If a woman is trying to control and lead all the time, she's very tapped into her masculine energy. Guess what that's going to do to the masculine man in the house, right? It's going to demasculate him. So women also need to learn how to step into their feminine, their free flowing energy, the energy that says, you know, I trust my man to take control of these things. Uh, And then when it's necessary for her, she taps into that masculine so she can get her work done or build her business or grow her empire, whatever she needs. But you can't, you you can't control everything all of the time. So learning to (laughs) balance that's not gender specific right for those listening mass and feminine energy is something we all have and learning how to balance that and and um, sometimes be submissive sometimes take the lead it's really important skill to have i so agree with you and uh i wish i could be in control all the time <laughs> Me too. <laughs> that is certainly my personality is like <laughs> you know order everything i just painted my whole house and i was just like i'm not I'm not going to keep anything. I'm throwing everything out, minimal living, nothing goes back on the walls, Mm -hmm. organize everything. And it just feels so good when there's order and not chaos, but that's Mm -hmm. your things. That's not people. Yeah, exactly. Great distinction. You know, organize (laughs) your house and your closet ladies, but like, let your man be who he is. I used to do that. I used to try and like, I'd buy clothes for like my boyfriends and like dress them how I wanted. I remember the Adam was one of my serious relationships when I lived in Australia. And he'll probably, if he ever listened to this, he'd probably (laughs) chuckle because the first time I met him, he was wearing these jean shorts that I didn't like. And I made him throw them out. (laughs) I'm like, who am I to tell him that he should get rid of his favorite shorts? Like, uh, you know, I don't want to swear, but I was a B I T C H in that moment. Like, (laughs) You know, and then I buy him things and kind of dress him the way I wanted to. And I was like, oh, I'm treating him like he's my Ken doll. I I was thinking Ken doll. It's really funny. Right. So I don't do that anymore. I actually, when I first met Andrew, we, I have a podcast where we talk, we talk about our first impressions uh, of each other on our first date. And I honestly looked at him and my, like for a millisecond, I thought, oh, what a dork (laughs) because of the way he was dressed. Um, and it's funny now, you know, the old version of Kimberly would have maybe tried to change something about him. The new version of me got to know who he really was. And now the funny thing is, is I absolutely love the way he dresses. In fact, I'm the first one to steal his t-shirts or wear his jackets because (laughs) his style is so unique and specific to him. It makes sense. And I'm so glad that I didn't try and change that because I love him for who he is. Um, and it's just, it's a nice thing to feel. Yeah. And he loves you for who you are, which is yes, equally does, important, yeah. right? <laughs> All the good and the bad. And the fact that he's dating a, a woman who's a men's dating and relationship coach, <laughs> like good on him for being a man that can tolerate that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it takes, it takes a certain type of person who yeah. has the, um, has the courage to do that because mm-hmm. a lot of people are intimidated by people sure. who are specialists in relationships. So they're like, mm-hmm. Oh my God, you're going to ana- analyze me. You're going to try to change me. So yeah. it's, it's again, these preconceived notions and we need to be more open. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kimberly, as we close here, I would love to hear the story of how you got into being a dating coach for men. Okay. I'm going to do my best to give you what I consider <laughs> the spark notes because it's, it was, it's strange. I, um, grew up in Vancouver, BC. And, uh, when I was in university, I wanted to do that little gap year travel. So I booked a one-way ticket to Bangkok, Thailand with my girlfriend. And the intent was to kind of travel for a couple of months, come back, finish the degree, get a job, you know, do what school trained me to do work for somebody else. Uh, but when I was traveling overseas that accidentally turned into living away from home for a decade and it landed me in a corporate career in financial derivatives in Sydney, Australia, and then in Singapore and working across uh, Europe uh, and Asia. So Kimberly ended up landing herself into a career that is pretty much 90% plus 
male dominated. So uh, in the Sydney, Australia office, there was probably a hundred people in the office, 98 of them were men. So for 10 years, I've worked with men. I've hired them, fired them, reported to them, traveled with them, listened to them, presented with them. Uh, I used to go up onto the investment banking floors, all guys, uh, women, sometimes you probably wouldn't see them because they'd be hiding somewhere in an <laughs> office. And, uh, and that was kind of my life. So I've always worked well with men. Now, did I know I was going to end up coaching men in this field? No, I didn't. I ended up uh, working with a coach myself for my own personal reasons. And through working with a good coach, I caveat here, a good coach, which who's a good fit for you. I learned a lot about myself, how I was showing up in relationships, what I really wanted to do with my life, why I was feeling at the time, like I was kind of living in someone else's body. And I was living in Singapore. I was traveling Asia. I was flying business class. I had the newest handbag every week. And I realized that that wasn't a representation of who I was. So spoke with this coach, recognized that I wanted to become a coach. I didn't know what kind of coach. All I knew was that I had this desire to support people, to make them feel good about themselves, to help build their confidence, to make them feel empowered and to give them a safe place to do that. And so I quit. I quit my corporate job. Uh, people thought I was either crazy or brave. I left my relationship at the time. It wasn't, wasn't the right one. I got everything down into two boxes and I moved back to Vancouver. And here I started my journey of becoming a coach. And Sandy, I started coaching women. I <laughs> wanted to coach women to feel confident, to rise up in their careers. And I spent a lot of time focusing on that niche until I then started working with another coach who then asked me to really think about where my strengths were. And it pointed me back to recognizing that I work really well with men. I support men in a way where they feel really safe to open up and be vulnerable with me. So he told me to focus on men. And I had all these self-limiting beliefs of why working with men just wasn't going to work. And when I was able to break those down and work through them, uh, this kind of business that I now run was formed. Uh, and so it started off coaching men around confidence and their lives. And very quickly, I recognized that the issue that most men were coming to me with was that their lives didn't feel great, but their dating and relationship component was what was causing them the most amount of stress. So naturally and organically, the business niched itself down to helping men in this specific area. And therefore my training all coincided with that as well. And here I am now as a woman <laughs> coaching men on dating and relationships. So it was a weird way I got here, but I think it was all meant to be. And yeah. That's a great story and not shocking to me because I've interviewed so many people, both on this podcast and the Women of Value podcast, which is really about women who found their passions and are creating positive change in the world. And mm -hmm. everybody has a meandering story. Yeah. It is not a straight arrow to success. It is. There you go. I've got the arrow tattooed oh, you on the arm, arrow. <laughs> which basically represents that. Like in life, sometimes you have to take a step back to be propelled forward. It's not a straight line. You may not know why you're always doing something, but you just are trusting an intuition. Um, and I've climbed a lot of mountains to get to the top of them to realize that I actually wanted to be way over there. Um, and just getting that perspective is, is what caused me to be where I am today. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. following those breadcrumbs and mm -hmm. really paying attention to your intuition. And yeah, and am I happy? Is this working for me? Is this mm -hmm. filling me up? And, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with the inner work of your values and everything else we talked about mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So Kimberly, this is such a rich conversation. And I know that men and women will really get so much value out of it. So if somebody wants to start a conversation about coaching mm -hmm. with you, what should, where should they go? So the best way to, to, to book a direct conversation with me, and there's never any pressure, it's just a complimentary call to find out if working with myself is right for you or maybe someone else. Uh, and the best way to do that is go directly to my website, uh, KimberlyNinaHill.com. 
uh, on there, you can click on the tab that says work with me and, and book a complimentary call to speak directly with me. Uh, if you don't want to have a call right away, but you want to just suss out a little bit about me and, and kind of the messages that I, I share, then I'd recommend following me on Instagram. Uh, again, Kimberly Nina Hill, uh, it's where I'm active posting lots of dating and relationship advice. Uh, and you can actually send me a direct message there as well. Uh, it's always me that will respond to you. So best way is to book direct on my website um, uh, or follow me on social media. Awesome. Thanks everybody for listening today. If you love our show, please subscribe, rate, review, share it with a friend. And as always, here's to your last, last first, first date. date. If you are ready to get unstuck gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.